turn on the recording. All right. So um, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. I am really excited to have Jennifer back. Some of you may remember her from an alumni panel that she was on in 2022. I don't know how many of you were here at that time, um, but she gave some great advice then. And I did run into her last year at a conference and we talked about her maybe coming back and doing a more intensive um, presentation on the business aspect of nutrition. So just to give you a little bit of her background, she is a clinical nutritionist and graduated from our program in 2017. She hosts a popular podcast called The Healthy Skin Show that you can find on every podcast app and also on YouTube. And she actually resolved her own health challenges with nutrition, which is what kind of inspired her to get her own master's in nutrition with the goal of supporting others to attain their optimal health. So now she is currently the director of her own virtual clinical nutrition practice that focuses on chronic skin conditions with clients all over the world. And she has graciously agreed to make a return appearance tonight and share some business tips with her, with us. Well, thank you so much, Linda. I appreciate the invitation to come back. And I also am so appreciative of the support that I've gotten from UB, not only when I was going through the program, from you both, <laughs> you and Dr. Lindner, but also afterwards. Um, it's a great community and um, it means a lot that you know, we're able to continue supporting one another. I think the UB network is really, really strong and there's a lot of great grads doing really amazing things. So I hope that this is inspiring to everybody tonight um, because sometimes when you're graduating, you don't know what all you can do, whether you should be a business owner or not. Um, and I hope that some of the things I share this evening will inspire you in some way, shape or form. Um, so we'll talk about some nutrition and, and nutrition business and marketing overview. Um, I want to share with you all uh, a bunch of background information so you understand how my business is structured because it's not just a nutrition practice. So there you can see I started with graduation. There's Dr. Lidner and <laughs> oh my goodness, Dr. Brady. And that was such a fine moment for me, such a proud moment. Um, and so I actually did the entire program virtual. It was very hard, very challenging. I learned a lot of things. And when I was done, I knew that I wanted to be um, a business owner. I probably am not a great employee, to be entirely honest. I love running my own business. Uh, so I started a completely virtual practice. And uh, you know, if you think about just the timeline, I graduated in 2017. And then the blessing of COVID was that now everyone is used to doing telehealth. In fact, they will ask if you do telehealth. So COVID, that was one blessing from COVID that has really made it a lot easier. Um, and so my practice, we work with people all over the world. We have clients in Australia, New Zealand, Brunei, um, oh my goodness, in Dubai, in Italy, in England, like we work with people all over the place. And so I actually have a team. It's not just me. I am the lead nutritionist. I also have a full-time associate nutritionist who works under me. Who She actually does more of the clinical cases than I do at this point. I still have some clients that want to work with me, but for the most part, most people end up working with her and I oversee her cases. Most of the, the other neat thing is that most of the cases that I do get to work with are typically MDs and nurses. So they're medical professionals who really want um, a different perspective on their case. They've tried everything in conventional medicine and aren't seeing any improvements. And so it's fun to be able to work with someone who has, you know, just so much of a bigger scope of practice than you. And they're, they're needing your help to sort through things, which is really fun. And so I also have a front desk person. So I know I have a virtual practice, but she manages the front desk, essentially, this virtual front desk. She handles payments. She handles communications, administrative things. Anything that I need to be taken care of, she handles, which is really great because it got me away from having to have like 
kind of slightly uncomfortable conversations about money with people. I don't have to do any sales calls anymore. That's all taken care of through the process that we've developed. And then I have a full-time assistant. Um, and then on the other part of the team, we have several contractors that help me with all the production side of things. And then we have a full-time media person that helps with all of the, the whole podcast. So all of the audio, the video, et cetera. Um, and so basically I have this podcast that has over a million downloads called the healthy skin show. And then out of that also develop, I developed this whole skincare and supplement line called NutraQuell and DermaQuell. And so those are specific to my audience. Um, I sell them through quellshop.com if you're just like curious and you want to see what it looks like, but that started in, I launched that in November of 2020. It was scared to death because I thought who on earth is going to be dumb enough to launch this type of business that's <laughs> really going through COVID and actually it turned out great. So you know what? It's never a wrong time. You just have to have your ducks in a row and get started. Um, so we have this whole platform that also includes one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching, group coaching, DIY master classes. Um, because I don't see clients every day of every week, and I have a lot of flexibility on the more creative side of things, I'm able to lecture at conferences and health summits, both live in person, as well as digitally. I do a lot of interviews on podcasts and the news media. Uh, I actually now this year can say that I have a book agent. So we're working on a book proposal right now to bring to publishers next, early next year, um, as I shared with the podcast and then the supplement line. So it's been a very busy few years since I graduated and my business has grown leaps and bounds um, because I just kept dreaming and just kept saying, well, what if, does this make sense? So I thought maybe to give you guys a little bit of a sense of what things look like now for me, it's a very regimented schedule. So if you're the type of person that hates a schedule <laughs> and you don't like to be locked into things, I have bad news for you. If you're going to be a business owner, that's not a good thing. You can't like be willy nilly. You need, need to have a regimented schedule. So Monday we do content. I have a planning meeting that usually lasts about two hours with my assistant so that she can go and take action on all the things that I need her to do. Tuesdays are full client days. Sometimes I don't have a full client load like this week. I don't. I think I have two clients tomorrow. So I'm going to continue working on my tasks and to do's. Wednesday, I usually have our clinic business meeting to make sure that we're on par for our numbers, knowing how many people have come into the practice, do we have any delinquent payments, all that kind of stuff. Are there any um, new things that we want to institute in the next few months, especially too with the new year, we're trying to get people signed up before pricing changes happen in January. And then I do a half client day. I'm usually done around like 5.30 or 6 sometimes. Uh, Thursday, I sometimes have business mentor meetings. Um, we do a clinic and research team meeting. My associate, I usually have other meetings scheduled. So it's typically like bouncing from one call to another. And then Friday, I'm trying to schedule in more time for myself to just think and dream. Um, that's what we CEO time. I'm working on it. Um, but a lot of times it's recording new podcast episodes. We're doing social media, media planning, um, type meetings with the team, um, and all that kind of stuff, whether I'm doing like brand collabs or something like that. So that's usually like part scheduling, part interviews and other content that we film. So that's pretty much it. Now to say that I work 40 hours a week, I would have to chuckle because I work this entire weekend. So I do generally work more than 40 hours a week, but it is my my business. I am very passionate about it. I'm lucky that I have the team that I do. Um, it took a while to get here. I would say that the more regimented I became with my schedule and I realized that I had to do things in a very um, organized fashion, um, that was probably around like 2018, 2019. Um, before that, I like to be very like, go by the flow. I'll do this one day, do that the other. And I realized it just does not get you anywhere. It's very difficult to, to plan and having the plan for success requires um, a lot more regimented focus. So um, I'll talk a little bit about finding my niche because I feel like 
when I went through the clinic, I think they asked us to do this like business plan and such. And I really struggled with it because I wasn't sure who I wanted to work with. I had worked with people who had chronic gut issues when I got, when I was um, a health coach before going through UB's program. And I didn't really feel like that was what I wanted to do, but I didn't know what else was possibly out there. And so um, I was working with a business mentor at that time, and we went through a bunch of, you know, different types of topics that I might be interested in working on. And eventually I said, well, you know, I did have eczema when I was in grad school and it really stunk. I'm in all these Facebook groups and people really have, they give each other horrible advice. Like the diet advice is, is really it's, it's horrible. It's, it's really unsafe to some degree and it's horrible. Um, they just continue to tell each other to eliminate more and more foods, which many of you probably know at this point carries a risk of greater nutritional deficiencies. It reduces gut microbiome diversity, yada, yada, yada. It's not great. And so I thought, well, let me test the waters and see how this works. And actually I hosted an online event. I got all these speakers. Now, granted, I know some of you might go, I'm just starting out. I don't even know how to do this, but this was how I tested this. I did everything really cheap and um, had speakers come and they call those, you know, like online summits. And um, I ended up having 15,000 people show up to that event. And I realized that there was a huge niche. So and this niche was very untapped. I did a deep dive into Google trying to find other people that were in this space. I really struggled. There was a few pediatricians that were more on the integrative side. There had been no lot, no events being held. There was no podcast at the time, except for like dermatology specific, like derm specific stuff for medical doctors. And so it was what's called a blue ocean. There was really a lack of competition available. And so I also started talking about my experience with eczema and began getting more clients who wanted to work on their gut, but they happen to have these skin issues. And so I did a lot of on the job learning, unfortunately. And so some things I know in hindsight, I really missed with some clients and I feel like I hate that I missed it, but there was no way for me to know that at the time. Um, and I had to learn how to be creative with protocols. And so now I have experience working with people whose their primary complaint is one of these chronic skin conditions. I also only work with adults. Children and babies are very different group of uh, and also some herbs are appropriate, some aren't. There's just so many, so much nuance I find me and adults do well. Um, but eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, chronic hives or urticaria, seborrheic dermatitis, dermatographia, hydrogenitis suppurativa. TSW is also known as topical steroid withdrawal, which is something I only learned about because this is a particular group of people that tend to be prescribed a lot of steroids. Um, and then tinea versicolor, which is a um, a fungal skin infection. And so I have a lot of experience with this. Um, and it's a lot of fun to learn how there's different connections in the body beyond just the obvious. So, I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever had this experience, but like when I had eczema, I went online and I tried all of these like natural remedies and a lot of them didn't work. I was very frustrated. And so if you've noticed that, if you've been trying different things, if you have health issues or a loved one has health issues and you noticed a lot of the information online isn't great, that, and you're, you're in, genuinely interested in that area, it could be an area to consider focusing on as long as you feel comfortable with the level of you know, illness that... You know, you know, if, if we have clients that come in that say have cancer or they have severe MS or whatever, that's where I'm just like, hey, that's outside of my scope. That's there's just too much going on for me to feel comfortable. But if you can get really clear on where someone is on that journey who may have that diagnosis or concern, um, you you can really you do have the potential to help them, but you also have to be willing to do the research and to dig in because there's going to be so much nuance to it that you get like a smattering of things in school and then you get to learn how to focus once you get out of school by taking courses or going to conferences or talking to people. And so my 
experience with these skin conditions really helped me think outside of the box to ask questions that nobody else was really asking. And I realized that this was the thing for me to do and it's turned into a huge thing. So the, my clinical practice structure is, as I mentioned, I have this full-time associate. I live in Pennsylvania. She lives in North Carolina. My, my, um, my front desk person lives in South Carolina, so nobody lives near one another. Um, and then my my assistant lives like, I don't know, an hour and a half from me. I've met her once in person. And so we use a lot of tools to communicate. I thought this might be helpful for you. So that way you don't wonder what exactly like this type of practice is built around. And so we use Practice Better as our basically like the software like the, uh, I don't know what you call that, like the medical records, that kind of thing. I'm, I think you guys have probably been exposed to that. We use full script, um, Rupa Health for testing. We use Voxer to communicate. It's a really great free online app that anybody can download and you can talk to one another quickly. So it's not a slew of emails back and forth. Um, we use Canva to make graphics graphics and charts and all sorts of things that we share. And then we use Google Drive and G Suite tools. I do use Zoom currently, though I may be shifting away from that as for I'm I'm kind of messing around with my membership program and my membership platform at the moment. So we may not need Zoom anymore, but currently we use that. Uh, Dropbox, my my um my website is built off of WordPress rather than Squarespace. I know Squarespace is easy, but WordPress is the better option for searchability. Um, we use Creative Commons. Well, I used to use Creative Commons. If you want to use Creative Commons for images, that's fine. Just make sure you understand legally obtaining images and graphics and all sorts of stuff because I did not years ago and got in trouble around that. So just be careful. You can't just pull images off the internet and use them on your website. Um, I use a CRM. So that's basically how, how I send newsletters to people and email my newsletter list. And then Calendly for scheduling just private meetings. And then we use Stripe, which if you don't know, Stripe also offers... Um, a setup that we are allowed to utilize, which gives us access to using HSA and FSA cards. So if somebody has in the United States an HSA or FSA style health plan, they can actually use those funds in that bank account toward other things. And so you have to contact Stripe to request this. And if if you can't, that can really mean a lot to somebody that they can use the money that's kind of held in this account towards your services, towards supplements, toward testing. Um, and so that's that's a really big helpful thing for people to be able to offer that. And again, it's just if you get once you get approved with Stripe, because you have to, I think, use it now with Practice Better. Um, you just contact them even through the chat and let them know that you're a clinical nutritionist and, um, you know, they that you're eligible for the HSA and FSA um, approval on your account and they can get that set up. Now, as you get further along, um, you're not going to want people calling your cell phone. I used to give people my cell phone number. That's not a good idea. <laughs> So eventually I needed to separate that and I got a service called Grasshopper, which is like an online phone system. Um, you don't need that right now. Uh, I'll talk about some ways around that in a little bit. And then we use Help Scout for messages like um, through the contact box or what have you, because I have so many different websites. We need something that's a little more centralized for the team to be able to answer questions or customer service complaints or whatever. Um, and then we have Asana as our team board to track projects and workflows. We, we're currently switching our membership portal to Kajabi, which can be a really great platform that you can also build a website on and then a whole membership section that you can give people access to things. And they also, I believe, have a CRM. So that newsletter thing, they also have that too in there. So that might be something to consider. I get all of my images, music, graphics, everything from a company or platform called Envato. That way I pay a one monthly fee and I can have access to anything on there. 
And that makes me feel better because remember I got caught using somebody's Googled images like back in 2016 or 2015, it was not good because people will come after you for very large sums of money. Um, so I would not recommend doing that. And then my CRM is keep, we're currently switching to Klaviyo because it's actually better with Shopify. And so our shop is also moving to Shopify. It's a whole thing. There's a lot of tech involved because everything is virtual. Um, but it's nice to know the type of tools. So the one thing I want to say um, about being cash-based versus taking insurance is that my practice does not take insurance. We do accept HSA and FSA cards, but that's it. That's actual. That's actually someone's cash because they're paying that out of a bank account. It may be associated with their health insurance, but it's still their money. Um, I have never taken insurance. My father was um, a medical doctor and an ophthalmic surgeon. And I did his medical billing for years before I started all of this. And the amount of times that he would have money pulled back from just even doing cataract surgery and they just take the money back, They're, the insurance companies are difficult to deal with. And so I decided that I wasn't going to do anything around insurance. And so just so you're aware, I just want to throw some numbers out there so that you understand. Um, my practice generates typically every year around $350,000 in cash. So if you think that people will not pay for your services, that is 100% not true. Um, and I share this, not that I take that home, right? I have full-time employees. We actually have benefits, like full health and really good health benefits. We have an IRA plan. I have contractors. I have a lot of things here, expenses that I have to pay for. But I just want you to know that if you think you can't make a living doing this, um, that's not true. You absolutely can. And I'm not an anomaly. I have a lot of colleagues that even just working on their own just themselves, they have no real team members are making around $200,000 a year and they are cash-based only. So it is 100% possible to make money doing this. I know it's a challenge right after school and it may be that you go and work for somebody else and you get you learn the ropes of things. It doesn't happen overnight. This is a lot of work to run a business and I obviously do not get to just clock out and walk away at this point in time, but there is a huge difference between in profitability. If you don't believe me between the insurance versus cash base, there is a Facebook group for dietitians that talks about insurance and accepting insurance payments. And if you go into that group, and I'm not saying you should never ins accept insurance, but there's like, like a lot of rules about that. So you have to be careful if you accept insurance you might, if the person has your insurance, you might not be able to get them to pay cash. So you have to know the rules with insurance companies. Um, but they are, con they're like, how am I supposed to survive when the insurance company only pays me like 40 some dollars for an hour call? I don't know. That was why my dad, when he was about to retire, was like, I'm glad I'm leaving medicine. Unfortunately, insurance companies don't pay a whole lot of money. It is possible you know, to do that. But my feeling is if you want to work with me, if you're really serious, you're going to show up, you're going to do the work because you're paying for it. And if you want to submit the bill back to your insurance, so be it. That's completely fine. You can see if you can get reimbursed. But a lot of my clients are so happy with the results. They're not really concerned about whether they, you know, whether they get reimbursed for that because their quality of life is just so much better. So there's a huge difference in the mindset of the type of client that you're going to get. I want clients that are going to do the work. I can't go to their house. I can't do it for them. When people don't pay for things, unfortunately, the tendency is they're not going to show up. They're not going to do the work because they have nothing to lose. There's li We can say, well, it's the health. Like you didn't get to achieve like your better state of health and your health goals. But at the end of the day, those are those seem kind of like clouds floating by in the sky. I wish that wasn't the case. Um, you know, part of the reason that I have uh, the, like the Healthy Skin Show podcast, it is an expensive, I'm not going to lie, it's an expensive endeavor, but that's my way that I give back. I provide 
all of this free content that connects people with answers that they might not get from their dermatologist or it could be from a gastroenterologist or whatever. So I made a point to find a way to give back and share the knowledge that I have access to with the world. And so I just want to know, let you know that it can be done, that you can make a really good living doing this, but you also have the opportunity as well when you are successful to help others, even if they can't afford to work with you. So that's the thing that I give for free. I do full transcript, video, resources, links, all sorts of stuff. The research, if they want to bring it to their doctors, great. I also offer those master classes, which are inexpensive, lower cost options that are anywhere from $17 to like 30 bucks. And then they could also do a group program with us that costs around $300 versus, uh, you know, a program that could run them anywhere from like $2,500 up to like $6,000. So I definitely have made a, a conscious effort to have different price points to allow for people to be able to afford things. Um, but there is just a lot of challenges with taking insurance, um, a lot of headache because you have to submit the claims yourself. I'm not really sure. Don't ask me about like the super bills because I don't even know. I don't even bother with them. Um, but like I said, the insurance company, if they make a payment usually directly into your bank account, they can pull it back. They can just decide a year or two later, oh, you know what? We went back and re-reviewed these claims and we decided we we erred, we were in error and we are taking the money back. So you do run a huge risk with insurance companies, unfortunately. So just an FYI, it's mindset and profitability that I think are the busy, biggest factors. So in terms of getting the message out, I think most people feel gross about marketing. I don't know if anybody feels like marketing is kind of like you think of a car salesman. I feel like that's always the thing that I've been told is like, I, I don't want to be salesy. But the reality is marketing is like dating. I haven't dated in a long while. Um, but what I do remember is that the first date really should be like, hanging out with somebody, going to a coffee shop with them, sharing, you know, coffee or tea or something like that. And just getting to, to the point where you figure out if you actually like one another. And that's what this process should be like. There are steps of ascension as the relationship gets closer and closer. And so that first step is, can you get their email address? It might be if you're on a platform like Instagram, just getting them to follow you. That might be the coffee date. The next step is getting their email address because at any given moment, Instagram can shut your account off. It doesn't matter how big you are. You could also have somebody hack your account and never get it back. So you always want to take that person off of whatever online platform that you communicate or market to them with and have them on your newsletter list. So nobody wants your newsletter just so you're aware. Nobody wants it. So don't put on your website, sign up here for my newsletter. Nobody wants it. <laughs> they want solutions. And that first thing that they're going to sign up for, which is called a lead magnet, should be something they can consume within five to 10 minutes and solves a very distinct problem. So in this particular case, this is one of my lead magnet pages for my skin rash root cause finder. It's a horrible, I'm not going to lie, it's a horrible name. I'm not great at naming things. It's too wordy. But basically the point of this is to help people figure out out of 16 possible root causes that I've identified for chronic skin issues, what is their unique combo of three to six? Because that's why I say, oh, well, if these things all worked for Jane, but they don't work for Paul, why? They have, they both have the same diagnosis, right? But why is this not working for Paul? What's going on? And so the, the thing that I figured out was that it's because their root cause combo actually looks different. So that's why maybe what works for Jane might also make Paul feel worse. And so that's how I offer this to people. It's this huge long checklist that they can go through the different root causes themselves and then total everything up. And then they have some idea of which way to go. This is something that we also, like this, this is actually a part of my, uh, group program. It's one of the assessments that we use in a group program that I give away for free online. And so it solves that problem to help them focus. I also have a low stomach acid test, which is the um, baking soda 
test if you can drink baking soda and some water and figure out if you have low stomach acid. I have another one that's based on, um, let's see here. I've got the top last skin rash lab testy guide. So I give people some ideas of conventional labs and even some functional labs that could be helpful. The stop my skin rash guide. So that's a podcast guide. Cause we have over 300 episodes at this point and people are like, where do I start? So we have this whole guide on here's the first eight episodes you want to consume. And then if you have these particular diagnoses, here's where you want to go. And then we have an eczema smoothie e-guide that's for somebody who's really just still stuck in this idea that they're going to fix their, their skin using diet. So I'm looking at different types of people and what information they're actively searching for online. And so I have these different lean magnets for it. And they all I ask for is their first name and their email address. And as soon as they give that to me, that that is delivered to their, their inbox and they can consume it. And then I follow up with them via an autoresponder. It's not me, but it looks like me asking them, hey, how to go? Do you have any questions? What's your biggest challenge um, to get them engaged? And so, as I was saying with marketing online, there are so many different avenues. You don't have to do them all. You should not do them all. It is exhausting. I never shop on Facebook. I have somebody that posts that on a platform called Later. So Later can connect to a lot of these. We pre predominantly market on Instagram. We have stuff on Facebook, but I honestly couldn't tell you whether we actually get leads off of Facebook or not. I don't post much on LinkedIn except for professional stuff, like if I've been speaking someplace or if I did something really cool I want to share with other physicians and whatnot. Um, X or Twitter, we're still playing with that. I can't can't tell you whether that is working or not. We're really focused on YouTube right now. And I'm still always been on the fence with TikTok because I'm constantly afraid they're going to take it down because this is a long game. There's no like some people, yes, they put up a video and it goes viral, but that's not the norm. Some, most people have, you have to be really consistent over the course of months to possibly see improvement. I just don't feel like I want to put my eggs in that basket. So I just haven't. So for me, it's Instagram and YouTube. And actually, I think out of all of these, my biggest focus at this point would be YouTube. But remember, it can suddenly get taken down because people report you. You could have competitors that don't like what you're saying report you for false information. This happened. I've had a bunch of colleagues have their um, accounts hacked. So again, you cannot assume that just because you do all of this, you're automatically going to get it back if something happens or that it won't happen to you. It can happen to you. Um, so I will give you some tips about how to protect yourself, but ultimately the goal should always be to take the leads from the social media channel and get them onto a newsletter list. That's the best way you can protect your investment in marketing. And in terms of capture, capturing those leads, it's really important to email consistently at least once a week at, I would say no less than two times a month. No less. If you go to monthly, honestly, I'm on some people's newsletter list and I forget they exist. They email once a month. I don't even see their emails. I occasionally think of them and they pop up like on my Instagram feed and I'm like, oh yeah, I wonder what they're doing. That's not the best way to market. And you don't have to write this huge email. I think most people get so nervous about having to produce this huge newsletter that they just don't do it. But the reality is that like, if you look at my emails, if any of you sign up for my newsletter list, because I do this, by the way, I'll sign up for people's newsletter list because I want to see what their newsletter is like. And I learn from them. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you're not stealing their content. But if you're like, oh, that's a cool little tip. I like how they did that. Emulate it. There's nothing wrong with that. And so what you'll notice in my emails is they're short. I give you a little brief intro. I give you the link to go watch the YouTube video or to check out the full transcript of our particular post that week. I ask you if you want to comment. And usually if there's like some sort of thing going on, it might be down below in the PS. Sometimes it might be higher up, but it's like pretty short because I don't want to waste my audience's time. I don't like fluff and I know they don't either. And so it doesn't have to be a lengthy thing. And I just shared here with you ideas of things that you can talk about, but they really must be pertinent to your target audience. Like I do plenty of things personally that I don't think my audience would really care about. So I'm not gonna talk about the fact that like I got 
two copies of the pasta queen's cookbook for christmas like they're not going to probably care about that so make sure that it's something that is going to speak to their pain points that's going to be relevant but you also pepper in enough things that they feel like they at least kind of know that you're a human being you know like they like, I've shared with my audience that I have chronic back problems and that I have spent months and months at times in pain. And people actually really appreciated me sharing that because living in pain is really hard. And oftentimes people get dismissed and whatnot. So as long as it's something that your audience can relate to, uh, sharing a little tidbit about yourself can be really powerful here and there. But again, like you can do an article or a blog post on your website, a face, you can even like go directly to a Facebook or Instagram post or a YouTube video that you published. It doesn't even have to be on your website. It could be a brief client and story. It could be just even a news article or a hot topic. Like I saw everybody was talking about Ozempic for a while, you know, and they're all linking to like, hey, here's this article. Here's my take. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You could highlight a supplement or a food or a nutrient or a lab um, or some sort of lifestyle hack. You could also talk about things that don't work that many people often try and sort of like debunk it. Um, where you can even share if you've been quoted someplace on somebody else's website or on their podcast, share that. You can talk about events you're speaking at, trainings, um, lectures, or advanced schooling that you're doing, because guess what? Actually, people appreciate that you share you're going to that, because they're like, oh, they keep educating themselves. They're staying on top of what's going on. I really appreciate that they're constantly learning. Um, and then, of course, something like an affiliate offer. So an affiliate offer is where, for example, a lot of people in this community might know the company like Organifi or Paleo Valley. And so they have a lot of affiliates. I'm an affiliate for both of them. And so I share their link with my audience. They don't upcharge any of the audience, but because I shared it, if they buy things, I get a, a piece of the commission of their sale. And so that helps to, you know, and you can get revenue from different sources. It doesn't just have to be from your clients, but this could be through a discount code that maybe they give you or an affiliate link. And it can help you pay for some of your startup costs because they might be things you're already telling your clients to do. So always look on the websites of companies that you're recommending things for to see if they offer affiliates, um, an affiliate offer of some sort. So in terms of one-on-one -on -one versus group coaching, um, I would say that they're both possible. Just don't start with the group program. If you don't know who you really want to work with, you can't start with the group program unless it's super general. One-on-one -on -one helps you refine how your approach will be with those clients. Like what is your essentially your signature offering or roadmap or framework or whatever. And oftentimes, Sometimes one-on-one -on -one clients are extremely motivated. They want a personalized approach. They don't want to hear like the general, like, well, if, if, you know, it's this high, it could be this, but then if that, they don't want to hear that. They want to know like, okay, what do my labs say? You know, what should I be doing? What changes should I make that would be most beneficial because, you know, this is high and the doctor's concerned. Um, so they're usually very motivated. They really want a single private session. So that's one of the big differentiators. Programs are general. They are for educational purposes only. It's not a great idea unless you've figured out a hybrid model to like be talking about somebody's specific test results or their particular protocol in a group of other people. It can get you in a lot of trouble and then people are gonna take what you said about Sarah and apply it to them and they might not have the same issue. So you really have to be cautious about that. Everything has to be for educational purposes only, very general. Um, you can't give very a lot of specifics in group program, whereas the single sessions, you can develop these, pri these protocols that are based off their particular health concerns, what you're, the patterns you're seeing in their labs and on their stool test or their organic acid panel. You can actually review things with them one-on-one -on -one and talk about intimate details that they're honestly not going to share in a group setting. And I think it's really crucial if you are going to work with clients privately, you have to have a vetting process because 
you like, I know in the beginning it's tricky. You, you kind of have to sometimes work with whoever comes through the door, but not everybody's the right fit for you. Like I'm honestly not the right fit for everybody. I, there's person I've had clients that I've had personality conflicts with my associates had personality conflicts and we've had to switch clients as a result. So having a very clear vetting process makes a huge difference so that you can get the right clients. And it also helps you identify who your target audience is, right? Who are they? What are their pain points and who do you work best with? So I'm like, I work best with type A individuals. I have a really hard time with people that don't want to share, especially like when they're very quiet and they give one word answers. Like I have a hard time with that. I don't know what to do with that. (laughs) Um, So I want somebody who's really motivated. I want to be able to build them custom protocols and recommendations. Whereas with the group program, you're looking at DIYers. It could be people who are really new to the integrative process. So for my group program, that's the case. It's either somebody who believes they can get better themselves and they just haven't found the right thing to figure it out, but they're going to do it themselves. They're either new to the process. They can't afford private services, which is a legitimate thing. I know there's a lot of coaches that'll tell you, well, they just can give up their phone and their TV. Guess what? Some people legitimately cannot afford to work with us privately. Like that's just a reality. (laughs) of things like we can say until we're blue in the face that clients just have to find the money but the reality is some people cannot afford that and that's why a group program can be a really great place for them because it can bring down the cost of a program for them like tenfold so that's why it's excellent it's also for people who want to get to know you better but they're not really ready to work with you privately yet um and it also there are people who just aren't a good fit for private coaching who, you know, they're going to end up disappointed. They're just not, they don't have a good mindset and they're just better in a group setting. Um, And then perhaps as they learn, maybe, maybe they will be a good fit. So I think this is um, a great uh, slide in that I just wanted to share with you guys the difference. So group programs, they do help more people. They lower the barrier to entry. They offer more generalized content. As I said, it's not personalized. You cannot personalize it for them. And um, I just, again, don't, don't start if you're thinking of building something. I don't know that it's the best idea to start with a group program, again, unless it's really, really general. If you're trying to do something signature that's going to be your your group program, um, you don't know what that's going to be yet. So start working with clients one-on-one. And then there's also differences between like actual in-person, like meeting a person physically in a location versus virtual. I would say that people start getting sidetracked with traffic, kids, events, especially as the holiday comes around, they start having reasons to not actually show up. Whereas the virtual stuff is great because there's no commute. They can even contact, you know, I've had calls with clients where they just knew they weren't going to make it home. So we were doing the call in the car and it is what it is. They, they had their notebook out. They were taking notes. It was what it was. They were, they were showing up where they could meet me during their lunch break at work at their desk. So it makes the show up rate so much better Um, in terms of delivering uh, the delivery to a group program. Simplest option to start with is always best. Send out the content in an email. Email your list of of people that are in the group. Uh, You can also post it to a password protected private page on your website. So you set it to private and you put in password and then you have to give everybody the same password, but at least it's not accessible to the general public. Yes, you might have to worry that somebody might share the password with somebody else. But once that, um, that group is done, you can always change the password and lock everybody out of it after that. You can do private Facebook groups, but I will forewarn you there is... They're, they're, they're crawling Facebook and it doesn't have to be you sharing something about COVID or any of the other things that get people censored. They are, it could be somebody else and they will shut your entire group down. So I don't do anything on Facebook anymore. Um, I am very cautious to also be like shut down conversations that go in a direction that I'm not comfortable with because you can also be opened up to liability if you partake in conversations that if someone decides to take action, they can say that you recommended it. So I am very, very cautious about that. Um, You can do practice better. They have some group program options within there. There is a membership style website. Like I said, you can use WordPress, which is what I'm currently using, or you can go to something like Kajabi. And then there's resources. So for hosting your videos, you could pay for Vimeo. 
or use YouTube and set things to private or unlisted. There's also Rev where you can get transcriptions made of your audios. So if you prefer to talk, I'll give you guys another tip. I have a Google phone, but I'm sure there's an option on Apple. I record to this app that if I don't want to sit and type everything out, but I am like in a free flow of just speaking, I'll speak into the app and it will transcribe everything. And that way I can look through it and actually make sense of like either a blog post or a content idea or something like that. So you can use a lot of these different free tools to really help you. And then Dropbox is a great place to share resources, but you can also use Google Drive. So here are the things that I wish somebody would have told me. So first of all, you cannot help everyone. And if you, the sooner you learn this, the better. You cannot help everyone. It's nice to go, but if only so-and-so would listen to me, that's great. They, if they're not ready, they're not ready. And you're going to end up really frustrated and they're going to end up very frustrated. So you can't help everyone. You want to learn how to find the right people. Now, if you are going to open your own practice, know your numbers and review them monthly. There are a lot of nutrition professionals who unfortunately don't have a good grasp of their business financially. If you don't know your numbers, and I did not, spreadsheets and uh, uh, it's called a profit and loss or a PL used to make me nauseous. Like literally, I could not look at it. It was just overwhelming. And so I worked with my bookkeeper every month. We would sit and I would ask questions and he would go over it with me again and again and again until now I'm very proficient at looking at it, very comfortable. And the reason I say this is that when I've tried to hire other associates, the challenge that I have is that they'll say, oh, well, my rate's $150 an hour. And I'm like, that's not your rate. They're like, yes, it is. That's how much I charge for an hour. And I'm like, that's not your rate. That's not what you pay yourself. That's that's not what I pay myself. Um, that's not your rate. So your session rate is not how much your hourly rate is. It's less because out of that fee has to come all of the administrative costs, all the tech costs, all the business costs, all your insurance, your legal, all sorts of stuff, your taxes. That's not your rate. And you don't know that unless you really look at your numbers and you should look at them monthly. Um, then I was also shared this great tip, create SOPs and canned responses. So an SOP is a standard operating procedure. So what that means is as you start to do things in your practice or in your business, write out how to do it. Because guess what? Eventually you're probably not going to be the person doing it. And instead of having to teach somebody from scratch, you can hand them this SOP doc and be like, oh, this is how you do it. Because you've already worked out the kinks and you just hand this to somebody. Now, they're not going to be 100% at it the first time, but it makes training them a lot easier. And then canned responses, or if somebody keeps asking you the same question over and over again, you write out the response. You might need to tweak it here and there, but you can copy and paste it. So it makes it answering questions from clients a lot faster, customer service responses faster, because you literally are just copy paste. Um, in terms of protecting your with social media platforms, please turn on two-factor authentication. If you don't have a business profile now, do it now because people's accounts are getting hacked, even those who do not have um, businesses attached to them. Um, so please do that. That is one of the easier ways to protect yourself. It's not foolproof, but it's a better way. So please do that. Also, anybody you work with it doesn't matter whether they're a contractor, so you just pay them an hourly rate and they submit every month a invoice to you, a W-2 employee, I know many of you might not be there yet, um, or a consultant or a mentor or an agency, have them sign an, a non-disclosure agreement. Because the way you do things, you're going to discuss things about your business and you want it made clear up front that you do not want them to discuss that with anyone else. And at least having that signed will help some degree protect you because you also don't want somebody to go and take what you have created and start using it everywhere else and sharing it with other people, especially if it is really working for you. And then as I was saying, create distance between you and your clients. It's healthy distance, healthy boundaries. So even if you, it's just you, create a front desk email that is not your email. So like my email right now is jen at jenniferfugo.com. But I have front desk at jenniferfugo.com. Now, for years, this was until I found Deb, who's my front desk person, I was the one answering those emails. And I used to answer those emails as Tanya. But the reason I did that 
is because if they thought they were talking to me, they would ask all sorts of, like they wanted all of this and all of that. They want a mile. And it made it a lot easier when I had to say no because it was coming from somebody else, not from me. And the interaction wasn't with me, or at least they thought it wasn't. Now you could say that's dishonest, but in all honesty, it made my life so much easier and there was less conflict. And sometimes I was able to say things more bluntly that I felt uncomfortable saying to the client because there was a bit of a butting heads. It coming from somebody else made it easier. So that's my suggestion. And then also create a Google number, use the Google number for clients. Don't give them your cell phone number because the Google number is free. And at the least you can redirect it to your phone if you want, but you don't have to. So anytime I call clients, it's through my Google number. It's not through my cell phone ever because people will start calling your phone. They will, and they'll start texting you because they think, oh, well, I have your phone number. And sometimes you get that person that will just not stop. Um, also, you have to schedule time off. I usually schedule about 12 weeks off. I don't take all that time off, but that is also includes time. I just don't see clients. It includes travel time and whatnot. And it's really helpful because if I didn't do that, I probably would work all the time. So that's really helpful to look forward at like holidays and different things and just schedule time off even in the summertime. Like I said, even if it's just for me, and you can always choose to like book somebody in if you need to, but it at least gives you those times, right, where you can actually um, decompress. And then I'm going to be honest, entrepreneurship is not for everyone. It's not great for my husband. He did not do well. He used to work um, in the TV industry. It was not a good thing for him. But for me, I thrive in it. I find it fun. I love the challenge. I don't mind that this is basically what I do. Um, I really enjoy it. I wake up thinking about clients. I wake up thinking about problems that we haven't yet solved. I honestly, truly love it. There are some days I wake up and I go, why did I do this myself? And I'm like, oh yeah, that's why. But you know, I enjoy it, but it is not for everyone. It is not, there is no fast shot to success. This has been years of working really, really hard. Um, and I didn't have a team out the gate. I had a couple of contractors that I would hire for maybe five hours a week to help me with my website. But at the time, I already kind of had a little bit of a business going. And it took me a long time before I was actually able to pay myself. So I don't say that to scare anyone, but I do want to be honest that it's okay. Like my associate flat out told me, I don't want to be an entrepreneur. She tried it. She's like, it's not for me. I like waking up. And she went to UB. She graduated, I think in 2020. She's like, I wake up, I open my schedule. I see all the clients I have. I do that. And I go, and I go about dinner and the rest of my day. And she doesn't think about anything else. And she really loves that and thrives on it. For me, I love all the other things. Um, so Again, it's a personality type and it can be learned. I was not always like this. It's been a skill of also believing in myself, wanting to bet on myself um, and also having the right mentors as well. I think having mentors is so important, but you do have to make sure, especially as you guys go out into the world, you're going to be bombarded by all of these business coaches. Please be careful who you pay money to. A lot of them have not been successful or they're just trying, you pay to be in a room with these people. Like that's not really helpful. You want somebody who you resonate with, but who has legitimately had success in their industry. And so like one of my mentors, she has a very successful supplement business. In fact, she does not even see patients anymore because she is a naturopathic doctor. She only has a supplement business. So she has helped me grow the supplement and skincare line. And there's a lot of things that she told me that I would have never have known had I not had somebody guide me. And I have other mentors that help me with other aspects of my business, um, that have really been a big help. Um, I have one that helps me with the clinic and figuring out how do I 
do this with packages and can I do this and how do we sell this and they help you sort all that out you don't need that in the beginning but I just encourage you to be cautious ask questions don't allow your enthusiasm to um override your <laughs> senses because some of these people ask for really big sums of money and if you're not making money to justify it you do have to like ask how am I going to be able to make this money back so a few things to share with you as we wrap up um, I do have some suggested business books here I think in the beginning find your why by science Simon Sinek was really helpful um, there's also uh, traction um, was one book that was recommended to me that can help you set up systems in your business uh, to sell is human. Maybe if you're really struggling with the idea of selling people on anything, that might be a helpful thing. And then there's Profit First by um, Mike Michalowicz. I, I'm sorry if I butchered his name, but um, that book is really teaching you about how to be profitable and how to, to create a profitable business. Um, you do not want to spend all your money to like not have to pay taxes. I, I have come to the conclusion that the fact that I am able to pay taxes means that I have a success, actually have a successful business. I'm able to do all of this stuff and pay myself and all sorts of stuff. I used to have the mindset otherwise. I didn't, I would just spend, spend, spend. So I didn't have to pay any tax. That's a not, that's a horrible approach. You're not going to be profitable if you do that. So there was a lot of mindset shifts that have gone into this. And then lastly, there's the Blue Ocean Strategy. I'm going to first off tell you the book is really hard for me to read. It's like a Harvard book. So the general idea is that there's not a lot of sharks in the blue ocean area and the red ocean is where all the sharks are and there's a ton of competition. There you go. You read the book. But if you're really interested in that, that could be great. It was just a little too over my head. So I had somebody give me the the nuts and bolts of it. Um, I will share with you that Laura Schoenfeld is the mentor that I work with. She uh, specifically on my practice. She's an RD. She was very successful with her practice and then started helping other RDs. She has a great podcast. She's got um, a lot of content on Instagram, very focused on nutrition practitioners and is really, really great. And has also worked with different um, UB grads that I know as well. And then James Wenmore is a little different. He is more like online business. He has a podcast called Mind Your Business Podcast. So you can find that anywhere. I listen to different episodes. He's sometimes a little woo-woo, but I can overlook it. It's not totally my cup of tea, but he does have really good content. And so you can learn a lot from him just in general, if you're wondering how to set up a good business structure for an on more online business. Um, and many of it, the things can apply to a nutrition practice as well. Um, and then lastly, please stay connected. I, I'm obviously going to be, we're going to be graduates together. <laughs> So, um, you know, you've got my email, that's my Instagram, my website, I, like my, I said, my shop, if you want to take a look at it, it will be changing in the new year to Shopify, that's been a long process, and then obviously the Healthy Skin Show podcast. If you're interested in the connections between nutrition, skin, inflammation, food, diet, all sorts of stuff, anything about these chronic skin conditions, we have over 300 episodes for you, so, so a lot to do. Um, and then I, I think Linda too, we have a um, handout if you want to share that with students later. Um, that's fine with me as well with some of the resources and things. Oh, did you give that to me? Car Carrie emailed it to you uh, a couple hours ago. Oh, okay. I didn't see it. Thank yeah, you. No worries. No I worries. will share that. So that's all I have. <laughs> oh my goodness, Jen, you had a lot. I, I am overwhelmed. I hope it I didn't really overwhelm. Had, it was no, a lot to talk about. No, I, I just at the amount of different business aspects you covered in an hour. I mean, that was incredible. I think it was incredible. So I, tr I tried. I mean, I'm happy to did. also answer any questions too. I mean, I I I feel like again, I'm I I really benefited a lot from having mentors that were were willing to tell me the truth about what your business could be. And, and to be honest with you, initially, I think I was really struggling financially. So I didn't really start to make a 
profit, I think, and this is fair, I'm very comfortable sharing whatever I share here. I wasn't profitable until I want to say almost 2020. So really, like I started the nutrition business in 2017, but I was very afraid of finances. Like I said, I mean, I couldn't even look at the PL. I brought in a bookkeeper who was like, he was like, listen, your expenses are really high. Could you look at your credit card bill and ask yourself, do you really need to pay for all this? And thank goodness he said that to me because I was able to cut $50,000 of expenses for that year. I, I just was like spend, spend, spend on everything. And so for example, some quick t tips that I figured out, I was like, I was paying for all these different like gadgets to work on my website, like different um, apps and uh, plugins and things that you have to pay like a monthly or an annual fee for like $34 here, you know, $97 a year that whatever adds up, adds up death by a thousand cuts. So I went through and I was like, well, I wonder if on Envato that remember that platform I shared with you guys, I'm paying a monthly fee for that. I wonder if they have a plugin that I can download since it's I'm already paying for it. And lo and behold, they did. So I was able to cut all of these expenses by just thinking creatively. Um, so you can be super scrappy and start a business. You don't have to like go all out, but just be cautious, know your numbers from the get go so that you don't get sucked into what I did, where it was just spending so much money all the time and not being able to pay myself. I wish I had learned the financial bit sooner. And you can get bookkeepers locally who can help you even with a spreadsheet. Just again, meet with them once a month for 30 minutes. And it's amazing with time, you will really learn how to be able to see what you're doing, be able to know your numbers, be able to look at those spreadsheets, because that's the one thing. If you watch Shark Tank, they tell you, you got to know your numbers. And it's the same for anything. If you want to be successful in business, you have to know your numbers. Rinda, do you want to read some of the questions from the uh, chat? Yes. Or well, there's a lot of thank yous, Jen, and how amazing and helpful it was. But I do see a question about how, oh, this this could be a long answer. How does one set up a business to work with clients in different states and or other countries? So in other countries, you're basically working as a consultant. So how that exactly works, I can't tell you. Like we just have the client come, they pay us. There's no governing body. We essentially, I'm acting as a consultant for them. I'm not there, you know, I'm very clear with people. I'm not your healthcare practitioner. I'm not your doctor. I'm not any of these things. I'm offering my two cents and here's the action steps that you can take, or here's what you can go back to your doctor and ask for. Sometimes they have a practitioner in their particular country, but they need a bit more guidance or they need a different perspective on things to bring back to their practitioner. So they're literally just as a consultant, we work as a consultant. In terms of other states, that's where it gets a little hairy. So there's RD only states. There's, what is that? Is that nutritioned.org is the website, I think. Um, I think that's what it is. Nutrition, nutritioned.org. And so you can look up what the red states are, which unfortunately I think they're like growing. <laughs> I hate oh, to say it. There's a map on the ANA site too. That's not there, what you're talking about. Is no, it? there's no. there's okay. a that website gives you scope of practice for different types of nutrition degrees and um, scopes of, like health coaches, et cetera. So you can know what is allowable in that particular state. So like California, for example, there's no licensure. They allow anyone to call themselves a nutritionist, which I guess is good and bad. Um, you can, you have health coaches that are literally looking at GI maps and giving protocols when they're really not supposed to do that. So you can look at those, that, that list of states and determine where you can operate. I mean, I personally believe that you should try to get licensed someplace. Now I have colleagues that have differing views on this. I even have RD colleagues, like registered dietitian colleagues who like have very differing views on it. They're not all like the RD board. They, some like think that's all malarkey and they don't understand why anybody cares. 
but some do. Um, so red states are states that you should try and stay away from. I think Ohio might be one, uh, Florida may be another, um, but I'm licensed in my state. Certain states are really hard to get licensed, like North Carolina. So if you're if you haven't graduated yet, you should find out whether you require licensure in your state to practice. If you don't, um, Alaska, believe it or not, is an easy state to get licensed in if your state doesn't require licensure. Um, I only know that because some people have done that. Um, but Pennsylvania didn't require it. It's a green state, but I felt like it helps show that I am abiding by the ethics in my state. Um, I know some colleagues have not gotten licensed, but I felt like it was a good step to do. And it's really not that hard to maintain the licensure. So um, in terms of operating there, there's probably a lot of red tape and different things that you have to sort out with your practice and whatnot. Um, but you know, it, it just depends on where people live, in all honesty. So you might want to get clear on a list if there's certain states you're not comfortable with. Unfortunately, I guess fortunately, unfortunately, it is extremely gray. Um, where ha, Like the whole telehealth thing is gray. So I would just tell you to be very careful. You don't want to be the example. I try to not be the example. Um, and you have to decide what your level of comfort is in terms of risk and talk to your attorney. Um, you know, I would make sure that if you if are thinking about taking clients in other states that you speak with an attorney and you understand what your risk is and how you might have to describe that relationship in terms of a particular state that, you know, it stays hopefully um, on the up and up. Thank you. Okay. Another question is, um, how do you how did you go about getting your mentors? Oh, um, I mean, part of it is asking around. You get to know people with time. My um, like Laura was actually a colleague, Laura Schoenfeld. She was a colleague, so I knew when she started transitioning away from seeing clients and working more with different nutrition practitioners. And then eventually I, I said, Hey, you know what? Can I work with you for like a half day? Sometimes she would just do like a half day call. I don't think she does that anymore. And I said, I'd like to, you know, kind of want to test her out, see how she did. But I was like, I'm having this specific issue. Could you help me figure out how to raise my rates without, you know, the, like this exorbitant amount, it, or it felt exorbitant to me. Um, so that I could hire a front desk person or how do we change the vetting process so that we're getting better quality clients. And so that's how I started working with her. Um, my other mentor was somebody that I knew and I approached her and asked her if she would do some sort of mentorship. Um, so I've also gone, I've, I've joined what are called business masterminds where it's you and a bunch of other business owners get together. Some of those are hit or miss. Some of those are excessive amounts of money for like paying for friends and you don't get much benefit out of that. So again, I would just be cautious of what you're paying money to attend. Um, and also if you are sharing private business information, you make sure everyone has signed an NDA because there is they can go blab everything you've told them about your business if there's no NDA signed. If they're not willing to sign an NDA, that's usually a red flag. So, um, you know, unfortunately there's no listing of people, but I also like, there's times where I'm like, Hey, I'm interested in joining a mastermind and I'll follow that person. I'll see who's in their mastermind. I'll follow them. I'll see how actual success, actually successful they appear to be. And then if I do happen to know somebody who knows somebody who used to be in that, I'll, I will reach out to them and ask, well, how was this? What was the value that you got out of it? Did you find a benefit and did you see, um, a value to the money, your investment. Um, I, cause I just, I'm at a place I've spent too much money. I'm not paying for friends. I don't need that. Um, and that's what a lot of these masterminds are. So that's just why I say, be, be careful and also make sure that that person did have a successful business. Um, and you can always reach out if they're sharing people's success stories, go like, especially on Instagram, we'll tag the person, go follow that person and then say, Hey, I'm interested in working with so-and-so just out of curiosity, you know, what's been your experience. A lot of times people respond. Okay. 
Um, next question. How did you set up a price initially? Did you start with only one session or a minimum of X number of sessions for a package? Yeah, so I, that's a good question. So I used to just do single sessions and I found that one of the problems it's with psychology is that every time somebody has to pay you, they have to decide if they want to do that. So it's a lot easier to ask somebody one time to commit to a program that includes a lot of sessions than every time being like, I'm going to charge you X amount of dollars. Is that okay? So it's not, it's not being sneaky at all, but it is using psychology to your benefit that if somebody commits to something up front, um, you know, some people also want a longer term commitment one off. So, and also some people who buy single sessions think they're going to get better like magically better from one session. They're not really truly committed to themselves. So I personally think it's better to do some sort of package where you have an initial longer assessment, mine is an hour, and then we have follow-up 30-minute sessions every seven to eight weeks because that's usually how long it takes somebody to go entirely through a protocol, make all the lifestyle shifts and everything. And so we only offer packages we only, so there's one time where somebody can do a single session and it's, you have to go through our group program and during that group program, only those people in the group program can opt to do a single call to support them because they can actually do a lot of the work themselves in the group program, but that's it. Other than that, you cannot buy single calls. Um, it's also a lot of energy to create a whole case file, to go through the process of assessing somebody and then they not come back after one one session. It's a lot of work on your part. So I would say something like one general, like big session. And then either you do like one 30 minute session once a month or once every six weeks. And that way you can work with them over the course of like four to six months. And, you know, again, you could break that. So let's just pretend like we'll do even numbers here that you're going to charge the person a thousand dollars. Okay, for that, like they're going to work with you for five months for a thousand dollars, right? Because in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much money. It's like two hundred dollars a month if you break it up. But if, say, they want to opt for a payment plan, you're not going to charge them two hundred dollars a month because you will quickly discover you're going to pay a lot of credit card processing fees. So you have to increase the payment plan. So now it's Okay, you can it's either a thousand dollars up front or it's two twenty five a month. And so a lot of people, not everybody, but some people that will they'll go they'll do the math and they'll be like, oh, I'm gonna pay the thousand dollars up front. Now look, if it doesn't work out and they're a horrible client, you don't like working with them, you can always give them money back. You can. It happens. Sometimes I work with a client and I'm like, this has gotten way too complicated. There's you know what? Let me just add up how much we actually used. And you know what? I think you'd be better seeing this person or this doctor. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I don't have it in my agreement, in my agreement, because they sign an agreement that they are responsible for the, for the full amount. But it's my discretion if that's the case. If it's not a good fit, I don't ethically feel it's right to keep a person's money. So I will give them a portion of it back, which they often very much appreciate. Um, it doesn't happen often, but you always have to upcharge the payment plan because of the credit card fees. Um, otherwise, you're going to end up losing money on it. Great. Okay. Another question. Do you worry about future limitations on your ability to practice as more and more states make restrictions? No, I don't because I've also diversified what I'm doing, right? People all over the U.S. can buy my physical products. I also have digital products and I have a group program. So group program is just for educational purposes only. So are the master classes. Anything digital is for informational purposes only. So it doesn't matter what restrictions are placed. I'm not a practitioner. That group program that I have does not, and I am very explicit in it, that it does not create a practitioner client relationship by them going through it. It's for informational purposes only. And so I have all of these different opportunities. Like our group program has 
typically 80 to 90 people who sign up to go through it at $300. So each. So I, I, I'm not worried. I'll find another way. I think, I think, yes, it's something to probably keep in the back of your mind, but also I think sometimes when we get too caught up in all the negative things, we forget to look for the potential, for the possibility. And I'm not going to, I'm I'm all about advocacy. I really believe that we should advocate for our profession because there's, I have worked with a number of RDs who literally didn't understand that the daily value is like worthless and were terrified to take very needed higher dose vitamin B supplements as a result. But, you know, there's a lot of confusion, but then there's some really awesome RDs that are very functional, very integrative, and they're very like kind of rogue and they do their own thing. And I have very good friends that are RDs. So I don't, I don't want to get caught up in what I'm not allowed to do. I'll just find another way. I'm extremely persistent. I love that. <laughs> tell, me I, tell me I can't do something and I will find a way. That's a great <laughs> attitude. So there's two similar questions here about supporting yourself while you're growing your business. Um, did you work part-time or full-time? Mm-hmm. How yes. long did you have to work another job? So yep. yeah, good question. Growing, right? What are you yes. doing? So I did work about thirty hours a week at my dad's practice. So I was doing. Remember, I said I was doing medical billing. I was working in the exam rooms with him, with patients, um, and then I was doing my stuff in the evenings and on the weekends. So I started that way. Um, and then eventually I got to a point where it didn't make sense anymore. I needed more time because I was growing. And so I said, Hey, you know what? I'm not available on Mondays anymore. I'm not available on Wednesdays anymore. And so I was able to take more away. Now, again, having that diversified stream of income where I said, like, you could use affiliate links to earn some money, like say you recommend red light therapy to your clients. Well, red light units, a lot of those affiliate programs, you could be looking at like 60 to hundred dollars per referral. You know, look, if you get one a month, that's some money. If you have a YouTube channel, you might end up, if you're getting good views and whatnot, you could end up having maybe a hundred dollars or $200 a month from YouTube advertising fees that you generate from just people watching your videos. You might have, um, you know, full script. You can make money off of full script because they allow you to mark. I think your markup is like 35%. You could lower it if you want. I don't. Um, so you can make some money that way off of supplements. Um, do not, oh, good one. Don't put Amazon affiliate links in emails on practice better behind paywalls. I got banned from the Amazon affiliate program from doing that. It really wasn't that much money, but just, (laughs) I don't do that. Um, but there's different streams of revenue. And then you may eventually also work for brand, other brands. So sometimes like I worked with Solaray, they paid me to do this thing with this per- prebiotic powder that was pretty neat. Um, you might also be able to partner um, with other companies um, where they might be able to promote you to their list. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, you know, and then like the master classes, I typically will have an idea for a master class. Like, I'm actually going to redo my eczema master class and my psoriasis master class, and then I send it out to my list. Now, granted, I have a big list, and I don't necessarily need other people to promote it for me. But if you have other friends that might have an interest, I just charge twenty five bucks to attend this class. Um, and like each time, now, granted, again, I have a larger list, but I would I usually make around five thousand dollars just the initial present two hour presentation of just showing the slides, talking through them and answering questions. So you can come up with different options as you go along to make money. You can get paid to do talks, you know, at local centers and um, online. I would highly encourage you to, if you get comfortable enough, do podcast interviews, like start with small podcasts and get your legs about you, speaking about topics, have notes in front of you too, that, you know, you don't lose your train of thought. Um, 
but there's a lot of things that you can do to make an income. You can also too, I know some RDs, they will do ghost writing. You could also do ghost writing for somebody's website. So I'll just let you know, like if I have somebody write a website, now granted, I always have to tweak it because I'm like that. But like to for me to get an article that's like 1200 words is about 550 bucks to pay a writer to do that. You can help somebody with their social media. You can do other things or you could go work as an associate for other people for a while and actually learn their protocols, how they do things, how, you know, and you don't even have to worry about that. You just get your sea legs under you and then eventually you can go off and do your own thing. Um, so, but yeah, there's a lot of different, different options. Well, I, you've shown so many possibilities here, Jen. I, I think that's the greatest point here is that that really the sky's the limit mm -hmm. yeah and and you're doing most of them yourself single-handedly <laughs> um, not so, single-handedly no, my single -handed. team okay. I could not yeah. I do want to get but it you are doing I, I could not then. I'm the oh. idea person and I'm the one that like goes in and I'm like oh that's not in the center my OCD starts coming out I fix everything or I'll be communicating with the designers on things and whatnot. But like at the end of the day, if something, you know, I, um, I take a, my team is very self-reliant. I don't like to micromanage. And I also believe that people should take ownership of their projects. So I also own my mistakes. And when I mess up, I am very clear with the team that I made a mistake. Cause I don't feel like they will feel comfortable saying that they've made a mistake if they don't ever hear me acknowledge that I've messed up. So I try to model things as best I can for my team. I think that's really important, but you don't have to worry about hiring somebody full-time out the gate. There's a lot of contractors, but just know what the laws are in your state. If you do decide to hire somebody because they vary state to state, there's some states I can't hire in because I don't have a business presence there and working in that state, unfortunately, is very complicated. So just be aware of that, that you if you do end up hiring employees, you have to be very careful because the online thing made it, conf it really, it was great during COVID, but now they've really restricted the laws again. So you have to know the laws of the state that you're hiring um, an employee and, and know if you're comfortable working within them. Great. Okay. There's just a couple more questions sure. and then we'll wrap it up. So there's one about, um, could you share some of the price points um, that business mentors. mentors, yes. So a lot of times to do like group programs with that business mentors, usually for like very basic things, it's around, believe it or not, like $2,000. Um, so my one mentor, I think I pay around $1,300 a month for an hour and a half call. Um, but I also get access to her and her team for like questions if I need them. Um, and she'll make introductions. Like the reason I got to speak in London at the Health Optimization Summit was because she made that connection for me. And that got me the invitation to speak on the stage. So again, you don't have to start there. Don't feel like you should. Um, I've been in some business masterminds that were on the up for scale of like $30,000 for a year. Yes, it's a nauseating price. Don't mistake that. That is a nauseating amount of money to have to sign away unsure of what you're going to get out of that. It was not, by the way, it was not a good use of money. I learned that very quickly. Um, but yeah, I think some mentors could be like for a half day could be anywhere from like $400 to $1,000. It just depends. So a lot of times in the beginning, um, there are uh, like Laura has a really great um, business. I think it's called the Nutrition Business Accelerator. And so it's a great online program for like eight or 10 weeks or something that um, my husband worked on her. So I got to listen to all the business coaching and I was like, why did I have that? Like five years ago, that would have made my life so much easier. So there are some great people out there. Um, 
And, you know, feel free if you're, you know, you can always message me on Instagram. Hey, have you ever heard of this person? I do it all the time. I have no shame. I'm like, well, they will just, they just won't respond. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it. I have no shame. I ask. Um, but yeah, it can be very costly. So like I said, just make sure that you vet whoever you pay money to. Okay. The last question is about social media. Um, do you feel that your social media presence gains you one-on-one -on -one clients or more traction with the lower price point group work? Yes, it does both actually. Um, so the first thing is that like, especially with Instagram, I'm testing this out on YouTube. I can't tell you about YouTube yet because we really didn't go all in until July. It was like after I got the chance to meet Max Lugavere, who who does the Genius Life podcast. Some of you might have heard of him. He spoke at the Health Optimization Summit. We happened to like be on the same flight back. And so we got to talk endlessly about YouTube. And so I was like, all right, I'm all in. I'm going to do it. So we're doing it. But long story short, Instagram is where I share higher level content. And you can even go to my Instagram account and see we have like a way that we post content. We drip out a specific topic. I answer questions. I usually lead things back with a lead magnet. I don't often do a call to action of asking people to come to sign up to book a call because to be honest with you, we're usually extremely busy as is. So but we will have people who will message me then, are you taking clients? And then I send them to my work with me page um, on Skin Interrupt, which, so if you go onto my website, skinterrupt.com, or if you go to healthyskinshow.com, it'll take you the same place. It's just like such a mouthful. And you go to get help and then book a session that tells you the process. It gives you an idea of price points. I would caution you from putting your prices on the internet. Um, it, it, cause people get sticker shock and they, they go, Oh, Oh, that's $600. I don't know what I'm getting. You don't need, you can give them a price range. They can self-select from there. So for us, we say some, I think it's something right now, like three to $6,000, something like that. If they're not comfortable with that, they're not going to sign up for a review call. And we ask the question again in the sign up form, um, do you understand that working with us is a significant financial commitment of blank to blank dollars? Is that okay? And then I ask, how will you pay for this? Because I want to know, are they going to pay for it on a credit card? If they say, I have no idea, that's pr they're probably not a good fit. You would know up front. If they say they're really, um, you know, they're really struggling financially, that's where I'm like, hey, I have these master classes. I have this group program that's like a tenth of the price. This is probably a better place for you to start because I ethically don't feel good about people going into massive amounts of debt just to engage in the integrative process. But that's a me value. Um, so I, I think, yes, you're social media can be the coffee date. To, for me, that's what it is. It's the coffee date to get people to, first of all, primary thing is to come over to um, opt in for a lead magnet so I can get them on my list. And then I have a whole series of emails. Like if you opt into my list, you'll see the whole process. Um, and you'll go, oh, that's what Jen's talking about. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I have this whole series of emails so they can get to know me, different areas where they can find me. And then it goes into broadcasts, which are the things that we send out either twice a week or once a week about the podcast or something. Um, but yeah, I, that's, I think it absolutely can be a part of it. It doesn't have to be the full thing. Like if you develop a list of referrals, like chiropractors, other naturopathic doctors, regular doctors, I think, you know, you might not need that. You could be busy enough just from the referrals alone that you don't need it. But you also have to know what the legalities are in your state of it. Sometimes people want a referral fee and it's not always legal for all the different professions. So you really have to be careful in knowing who you can give a referral fee for. Um, so generally, I don't think you're supposed to, but with like that, maybe trainers, you can, I don't know. So there's just like a lot of things. We just don't do that. So, um, but I think it's nice to have varying, I like to, I like to control 
<laughs> my own boat and I like to row my own boat. And so for me to depend entirely on one thing feels a little short-sighted, which is why, you know, do I get some referrals from doctors? Occasionally, occasionally. But so I don't put a whole lot of weight into trying to convince derms to send me their patients. It's okay. Um, if they do, awesome. I have one one doctor that does and one acupuncturist who does. But again, it's not everybody and I'm not for everybody. So um, yeah, I, I just think like it's good to have different avenues to meet people where they are. Jennifer, the one more question here, one just came through, it was really good. Um, when were you able to hire your first employee? So my first employee was the front desk person. <laughs> That was usually support staff is like the first thing you should hire. Um, and I hired Deb. That was like almost two years ago. No, it was. I think it was like two years ago. And I was at a point where, again, I was. it was too much of like, I was seeing the clients. I was responding to every question. I was, I was Tanya. <laughs> I was Tanya charging everybody's credit cards, emailing them this, writing all the letters that, contacting the lab. I was going crazy and I was doing so much other things that were taking me away from what I really loved. I was just exhausted. So don't wait until you get there. <laughs> um, you know, I wish that I had known sooner rather than later to probably get some sort of uh, like a VA or a virtual assistant. Um uh, I was told by an attorney that really you have to be, again, this comes down to your state, but you have to be careful. I had to hire Deb because as an employee versus a contractor, because she was going to operate in exactly the methods that I needed her to at specific time periods. And that's why if I originally was going to hire as a contractor and she's like, no, you can't do that because if she files a complaint, you're you're going to lose. So um, it's sometimes good to have a relationship with an employment attorney before you possibly hire somebody or ask somebody else who has experience hiring someone, whether that should be an employee or a contractor. I have a feeling in the next couple of years, that's probably going to get more complicated, but you could always just hire somebody for like five hours a week and there are VA services out there that you can get somebody who can help you do like let people into Zoom meetings, um, collect the questions, do all sorts of nitty gritty things, answer emails um, that really helps you um, stay a little bit more focused. And I brought on, and nobody asked, but I brought on my associate um, about six months later, originally as a contractor. Um, but as her hours got to almost 40, again, the employment attorney was like, that's an employee. She's not seeing her own clients. So I had to hire her. But um, it is possible, um, you know, that you can hire an associate as a contractor initially, if you just want them to work a certain number of hours. Um, but again, you have to have all sorts of legal agreements, NDAs, all sorts of stuff with whomever you hire, regardless of the relationship. This was amazing, uh, Jennifer. I think what you've shown the students here is possibility, because I remember 10 years ago, you were sitting in my anatomy and physiology class, right? That is true. I was. 10 years ago, 2013. So we all, you know, everyone starts at the beginning. And then you just had, you were dreaming. You said you dreamt big and you kept having this vision. And I'm sure as a student in our program, you weren't just thinking about the courses. You were already thinking about the end game, what you were going to be doing at the end and building that vision. And I think that's what you showed our you know, fellow students here at Bridgeport is all the possibilities and it's endless and you're still growing. You're still being creative as, as nutrition being a science a philosophy and an art, you're showing the artistry, the art, which is the creativity of saying, hey, I'm, you know, what was the name for the for the person that was the assistant that was you? Tanya. Texting? You're Tanya. And I think that's genius because it's creative, you're it's it's empowering. You're you're overseeing everything. 
but um, that's the art part of it. So I think you did an incredible job. I think the students in our program are seeing a bigger vision of what's out there for themselves. Fantastic. And, said, and, and that's, that's literally, I mean, I feel so grateful. It was when that mentor said to me, she's like, unless you see the possibility modeled for you, you don't know that you're allowed to dream that big and you're going to stay stuck with whatever you see right in front of you. And that was a big aha moment for me. That's why Linda, I was like, I don't mind coming in and sharing all of this. Cause like nobody showed me this. And for a long time I thought, oh, I, I can't go for what I can make over a hundred thousand dollars. What? No, I can't do that. I had no idea that was possible. I didn't even think that I would be allowed to create my own supplement line, but you are allowed to, if you want to, there's ways to do it. So I just, I hope that, um, for each one of you, even though I know that you're looking at a job market and going, I don't know, I have apprehension. I'm not sure. There are opportunities and just stay open to them, ask questions um, and, and know that you don't, You look, I have done this a long time. I've learned a lot. I don't know all the, I don't have all the answers, which is why I have mentors and I keep learning and growing, but you can do this and you add a huge skill set to our country. Uh, that we need desperately as people get sicker and sicker. And there are tons of people who do want your services, who do want your the help from you, but you do have to be committed to doing it. Even if it means you don't necessarily start out as a business owner right out, out the gate. Maybe it's for you, maybe it's not, but there are jobs out there. I have a lot of colleagues, even myself, been looking for an associate for like a year but it's hard to find people that are, you know, have the right qualifications and are dedicated to do this kind of work. So if you're really dedicated, there is a ton, there's more opportunity than you even probably realize at this point in time. That's a wonderful note to end this on. And Jen, I, I can't thank you enough. I, it was just wonderful. And I just looking at the chat, everybody, all of our students appreciated it very much as well. Well, so, if there's anything you. else I can do, let me know. Oh, be careful what you offer. <laughs> thank you very much. It was great You're to welcome. see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much.